Hi, and welcome to section 1.2 in AP Statistics. Uh, we're going to continue uh, what it is to explore data in this unit. Let me put this in proper presentation form. Here we go. So uh, again, not to read to you, but this is a list of topics we'll cover in this section. And uh, I'm going to specifically hit points that people tend to misunderstand rather than read everything to you. So let's get going. Here we go with a dot plot, uh, the simplest of plots to produce, especially with small data sets. That's when you want to use these. The book um, may or may not mention that, but uh, you would not want to do a dot plot with 60, 70, 80 uh, points in it by hand if you didn't have to. Uh, there may be better ways to do it, especially if you're permitted to use a calculator. Um, by the way, on the AP exam, every section of the exam, you're allowed to use your calculator. So if you have um, the need to draw a histogram on an FRQ in particular, um, you could always enter the data into a list and have your calculator produce the uh, histogram, make any corrections you need to on unusual class widths uh, on the bars, and uh, um, use it as a guide to draw it, to hand draw it on your FRQ. It's really fast once you know how to do it. I've posted a video in the calculator stuff section of your um, online course. So it's not me talking, it's just the shortest video I could find that explains it well to talk about how to enter lists and how to do a histogram. So please watch that. Um, for a dot plot, the calculator will not do a dot plot, uh, but we'll get to histograms later in this section. Dot plots are very simple by hand. You must include all of the items listed here. I'll say it really, really, really frequently. You must put a label on it. I want to show you something. In this slide, here's our data set. Even though the dot plot is immediately below the data set, if you left off the label that says number of goals scored down here, you would be counted as incorrect because they do not want anything unlabeled on anything in the AP exam that you have to produce for an FRQ. So um, that is a major point. Other than that, just draw it neatly. You're usually drawing these by hand when you do them. Use the um, lid of your calculator for a straight edge uh, because you can't bring a ruler or anything into the, calculator, into the test. Um, and make your lines neat and your dots lined up neatly and all the level one dots uh, in line with each other and all the second dots in line with each other. Don't make the spacing between the dots different in different stacks of dots so that you can tell, you know, I can say, well, this is five dots here and come over and say, well, five, six, seven over here. So make sure they're lined up really neatly when you draw these by hand. All right, you can get great information from a dot plot that you can't see in a list of numbers. This is not a ton of numbers, but it's enough that you're not going to see this pattern. Your eye may catch the 14. Is it going to catch the 13 too? And is it going to notice that there's no entries between 5 and 13? Not very easily. So the dot plot is really a great way to go. You can also calculate median really easy from a dot plot. If you know how many data points there are, you find that middle one and it's in the row. The row it's in gives you your data points. So Median and interquartile ranges that we'll talk about later are very easy to judge on a dot plot. All right. So when we uh, are looking at a distribution of quantitative data, uh, dot plots are very helpful for helping us answer these questions if they're small enough data sets. Um, if they're not, there are other plots that are helpful to use, but regardless of how big the data set is or how small, you would be expected to discuss these features, the shape, outliers, center, and spread. And that's where our little acronym comes from here, SOX. So don't forget your SOX, shape, outlier, center, spread. You're not obligated to talk about these topics in that particular order, but it is a good way to keep you from leaving one out. People often like to talk about outliers after they talk about shape, center, and spread. And that's fine, just don't leave anything out. So when you're talking about a single distribution of numbers, you need to talk about these particular items. Now, uh, I don't want you to say the center of the data set is five because center is not a statistic. Did you use the mean to get that center? Did you use the median? Tell me which measure of center and which measure of spread that you're going to use because those two things are statistics, meaning the answer is a number, a single number. Shape is vocabulary word, so there's no number to describe shape. We'll get into that a little bit on the next slide. And then I um, want you to take note at this point of outliers, and that's kind of discussed briefly up here. Um, any points that strikingly depart from the overall pattern of the data should get your attention, okay? All right, so when you describe the shape, 
of a distribution, um, you're looking for whether it's symmetrical or skewed, basically. And I don't want you to say symmetric or symmetrical. I want you to say roughly symmetric or approximately symmetric. Because if you don't put a qualifier on it, then you're saying it's exactly symmetrical. And if it's not, it's wrong, even if it's just a little bit off. So use your approximately or roughly kind of statements to qualify how good is the symmetry. If it is exactly symmetrical, then say exactly symmetrical. But that is so incredibly rare that I can't recall it ever happening on an AP question that I've seen. Uh, so be careful with the word symmetric. Please tell me approximately if it's not completely symmetric. When you mention skewness, okay, so it's going to be one of these three. It can't be any two of them at the same time. When you mention skewness, you must tell the direction. So the tail is the skewed end. On our dot plot, on the uh, soccer data, the tail was to the right. We had an entry of 13 and 14 with a big gap. And so even though the gap is there, that's still considered a tail, so that data was skewed to the right. And you can say right skewed if you prefer to write fewer words. That's fine. Um, it doesn't have to be a certain percentage of the data points to be considered skewed uh, or to have a tail. And sometimes you're going to get data that just doesn't look like it has a tail. But you, if you're going to, um, if you're going to say it's it's skewed, and you're trying to decide between symmetric and skewed, uh, just be descriptive because they can justify your answer being right, even if it's not the word they would have chosen, if your justification for it is good enough. Unless you're just flat out wrong. If you say skewed left when it's skewed right, it's wrong, no matter how good you describe it. Um, so the tail is the end that you describe the skewness with, not where the massive bulk of the data is sitting. Okay, so one thing that students become concerned about at this point is, well, what if they give me one that could go either way? Well, they generally don't. They don't have questions habitually that you could answer more than one way and justify easily because they don't like grading that kind of thing. It's just a practical thing. So when you look at these, do you agree that this graph on the left is roughly symmetric? Uh, some people think that this last column, since it has five items in it, is not a tail because it's not one or two things hanging out on the end and it is over here. So some people would mistakenly call this left skewed. It doesn't matter that, that the end value over here is, has a lot more dots than the end value on the left. This does have a trailing side, all right? Um, there is some data that you could justify describing it as skewed based on the type of data that it is, like income. Income almost always is right skewed because you can't have negative income. There is a bottom value for income, but there is no top value for income, and there's always somebody who makes a ton of money. Um, so certain types of data are always right skewed. Um, number of siblings, that tends to be something, anything that you can't go below zero um, would tend to be more right skewed than left skewed in different samples. Um, but just make sure you're saying which side the tail is on. So here, this tail over here, even though there's a gap at four, this is considered part of the graph, and the tail trails off to the right for the sibling data. Over here for score data, this looks like test scores. So test scores generally have a max, and so I would say the tails would tend to be on the left side for test scores. Uh, so some of that you can count on certain types of data having similar shapes from one scenario to the next. Um, and then we'll have a big portion of this class where we talk about uh, assuming things are approximately uh, symmetrical for um, more predictable use and making probability and statistics a more powerful tool. All right. Um, when you go to compare two distributions, you cannot simply say the SOCS description of each one. You must use language that describes the center of this data is greater than the center of that data because, and put the numbers in. You must say which is bigger, you must put the numbers in. It has to be a complete sentence comparing the numbers and saying which one is bigger. Um, I'm going to say it a bunch, but remember your audience is not experienced statisticians. Your audience are people, uh, uh, you're to consider your audience to be people who know nothing about statistics so that you cannot um, leave things unsaid. Okay, uh, they'll give you no credit, even though you describe something in a way that makes it clear that you know what you're talking about. If you leave something out, you just left it out. You cannot 
leave it to the grader, no matter who it is, whether it's me or the AP exam people, to assume that you know something. <clears throat> so uh, look at these two sets. We've got household size in South Africa versus household size in the United Kingdom. And um, there are some ways that these two data sets are similar and some ways that they're different. And you want to point them all out, cover all the topics. Okay, so there's some potential outliers in South Africa where there's not in the UK. And you would list that value. Uh, shape. Um, so I usually like to take a head count of people who think this is skewed left versus uh, roughly symmetrical. And I would say it's roughly symmetrical. Um, don't really consider this much of a tail over here. Um, when all I would have to do is pull a few dots over here from the right over here, a couple of two, three dots, and it would look much more symmetrical than it is. Uh, whereas this is a clear tail up here skewed right for shape. Uh, center, like I said before, median is probably the easiest center to calculate. So you would count how many dots there are. You would find the middle dot in each distribution, and you would say the median of South Africa is this specific number. The median of the UK data is this specific number which is higher or lower than South Africa. Um, I'm going to be betting just from glancing at it that the UK center is lower than the South Africa center. Um, <clears throat> and spread. Spread right now, you know, uh, range. That's the highest value minus the lowest value. Not, uh, please make sure you don't say range is, say for the South African data, anywhere from 3 to 26. This is not an appropriate measure of range. Range is a statistic, which means it's a single number. You would calculate it, oops, by saying 26 minus 3 is 23. The range of the data from South Africa is 23. You do not simply list the max and the min. I'll go ahead and subtract. The range for the data in the UK, 6 minus, I guess that's 2, is 4. The range is 4. The range is not from 2 to 6. The range is 4. Give a single statistic for the value of range. We will learn other measure, measures of center and spread. Um, and you generally get to use which ones you want, but median is the easiest thing to read off a dot plot. Okay. A stem, a stem plot or a stem and leaf plot is uh, the formal name of it. Uh, does present some challenges for some students, uh, mostly in how to break up the stems and the leaves, because in their example, it's fairly obvious. It's not always incredibly obvious. Um, but until we see one, all these how-tos don't make a bunch of sense, okay? So I'll let you um, take note of those steps, and let's go look at one, okay? Um, <clears throat> so we've got 20 responses on um, how many pairs of shoes do you have? They've asked AP Statistics students, okay? So knowing the guy that wrote this book, he's a friend of a friend, um, he probably did ask one of his classes this, and that's probably where he got this data. So we have all two-digit numbers, so the tens digit is the stem, the units digit is the leaf. And you have to include a key in a stem and leaf plot, or you will not get credit for having done the, the plot right. Um, so over here they say when you have 4 slash 9, this represents a female student who reported 49 pairs of shoes. So step one was to choose the stems, and our data stretched from our lowest value of 13 to our highest value of 57. And um, so you can eyeball lowest and highest to get your stems, and then you just start filling in the data. Just read one at a time, and notice they're not in order the first time through. But ultimately, you put them in order, and you could reproduce the data set in order. 1, 3 would be 13, and 13 would occur three times then 1, 5, then 1, 9, and you can re reconstruct the data set and they would all be in order. Again, this is for smaller data sets. If you had 50, 60, 70 data points, a stem and leaf plot might be tedious um, and might be hard to make neat enough to be really useful. It does, in my opinion, look kind of like a little histogram turned on its side. So if you tilt your head to the right, you could see what a histogram would look like for that data and you could tell its shape. Um, so I definitely think this data is skewed to the right uh, toward the 40s and 50s. Um, so even though there's four, date, four data values in the 50s, definitely doesn't match what the data is doing on the lower end. So um, you can use a stem plot similarly to a dot plot turned on its side or a histogram. Um, when there are more than two place values in the numbers that you're having to put in a stem plot, you might have to change the stems to be the first two digits 
for the first three digits. It just depends on how the data falls out. So make sure you ask any questions that come up when you're making stem plots in the homework. Okay, so sometimes um, it's helpful to put two sets of data in one plot. So uh, here's two sets of data, one relating to females, one relating to males. And instead of making um, one through five or zero through five for stems, when you get a ton of values, see look how many values um, would have been under single digit numbers. Um, and they split it so that um, the first stem of zero has the numbers, the, the units digits zero through four. The second stem has the units digits five through nine. And so that can help you sometimes split it out um, to make your stems not quite so long if the data is um, getting to be a lot of data all along one line. Um, they also, I think they were putting together all of this data on, actually, did, what did they do? They did, did they include, this was just males, okay. Um, they didn't even put the female data here, but if you had two sets to compare and the stems were the same, you could put them on the same plot here. So this is actually very helpful um, splitting out the stems so that the data isn't quite so long over here. It didn't help as much on the male data, but it still gives you a basis for comparison that maybe single stems that were not split would obscure because the groupings are too large. It's like if you were making a histogram, how many columns would you make? All right, um, so let's talk about histograms. Um, one thing, I don't want you to confuse a histogram for a bar chart, because a bar chart is for categorical data and histograms are for numerical data. Um, visually speaking, you can tell them apart very quickly because histograms don't have any space between the bars. They're all jammed up next to each other uh, so that they don't skip values. So here are the steps to make your histogram. Um, if you go watch the like two minute video that I posted in the calculator stuff, you can learn how to put the data into your calculator and then how to make the calculator draw the histogram for you and learn how to adjust the uh, horizontal axes so that the width of each uh, class is not only uniform but a nice clean easy to read numbers without decimals in them uh, unless they're of course needed. So um, these steps are great especially when you're doing it by hand. Uh, let's take note of the word class. A class is one range of values so I like the frequency table here where it says class. Our values from zero to numbers less than five and um, in the second class, five to numbers less than 10. So notice that um, they don't always put the less than sign, but it's implied that if I'm starting with 10 on the next class, um, that I'm not gonna put values equal to 10 in the class above it. Okay, um, so they would count how many values fall in each range, and then we would make our bars coincide with the counts on the top um, on the vertical axis up here. Um, you're not obligated to put them in order of height because what if they don't fall in that order uh, when you're counting up numerically on the horizontal axis. So this one just happens to be one that gets shorter each time. That's coincidental. Um, again, it's so much easier to make your calculator do this work. Your calculator will come up with weird values for the class width sometimes and the video shows you how to change that. So um, I would rely on technology for that for speed's sake on the AP exam or on a regular classroom test. All right, so um, I did allude to people confusing histograms and bar charts here. Um, <clears throat> one point of confusion that some people have for um, histograms or dot plots for that matter is they think that the height of each bar is the data. So I'm going to peek back here at the previous screen, they think that 20 and 13 and 9 and 5 and 2 and 1 are data points. When the data points are all the numbers listed in the classes. So it's not clear from a histogram how many data points there are unless you add up every column, okay? Which you're not really expected to do much. Um, you can do it if it helps you, but it's not an expectation generally. Uh, it is something you could recreate how many data points, but you can't tell me what they are. You can look at a stem and leaf plot or a dot plot and completely recreate a data set, but you cannot recreate a data set in its entirety from a histogram, nor are you expected to. So please don't become confused and think that that's something they would expect you to do. All right. Um, 
Okay, I, I like number three a lot. If you are being asked to compare two distributions that have different number of items in them, always use percentages on the vertical column rather than counts. It will make, make them the same scale and um, help you to see the similarities and differences between them. All right. Um, I, their, their bottom comment is nice, but I guess um, you should always strive to make any hand-drawn graph as completely neat and readable as possible. If it's difficult to read, they just won't read it. So uh, always include labels on the, all, any and all axes and scales on any and all axes in any plot that you draw. All right, that's section two. Thanks for listening.